Blackman uh, here from South Texas College of uh, uh, School of Law, and we have Professor Chilton uh, here from the law school. Uh, so we have a debate format, I think a little bit like rough. We'll sort of let them take time uh, and go back and forth and give uh, a good time for a rebuttal and then leave up time for questions and answers. Uh, first, uh, Professor Blackman uh, is a George Mason College of Law uh, graduate. He went on to clerk in the Western District of Pennsylvania and on the Sixth Circuit. Um, he teaches con law, the Supreme Court, uh, and for the intersection of law, uh, or technology, and law. Um, he was named by Forbes as a 30 under 30 in the area of law and policy. Uh, he is the founder of the Harlan Institute of wow. uh, Fantasy SCOTUS. He's got this memorized. This is a good no yeah. notes. This Fantasy is SCOTUS. Yeah, if we're uh, we're trying to get a, a little. Uh, a little get you know get some gambling action on the uh, the Supreme Court. It is not gambling. We are not Sandal. We are not DraftKings. There's no uh, money exchange. We are perfectly legal. It's a game that. of skill, yes. not a game of chance. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I'll leave the I'll leave the details to him. Uh, anyway, Professor Chilton here. I uh, got a bachelor's and master's at Yale. I uh, went on to do some consulting work at BCG uh, and then graduated from Harvard Law. Uh, and was a Big Low Fellow, formerly here. Uh, studies the area of international law, immigration. Um, and other areas uh, within that. So, Fred, please uh, give them a round of applause. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to LLSA, the Immigration Law Society, and FedSoc for hosting. This is my third year in a row speaking in Chicago, and I'm always very warmly welcomed. So, the topic for today's debate is the constitutionality of the president's executive action on an immigration. Before I go too far, I have a disclaimer. I feel uncomfortable attacking this constitutionally because I actually support the policy. Uh, I'm in the unenviable position that I support President Obama's ex immigration policies. I think the DREAM Act was a good piece of legislation. I would supported it, as was a comprehensive bill. However, the manner in which he's gone about taking the actions I think is unlawful. So I will not at all talk about the policy because I don't agree with myself in terms of policy. So to understand the executive action, we need a little bit of history. So in the early years of the Obama administration, one of the first pieces of legislation considered was something called the DREAM Act. Okay? The DREAM Act would have given a pathway to citizenship for the DREAMers. These were people who came to the country uh, uh, illegally as minors and went on to become high school graduates, college graduates, and otherwise upstanding human beings. Now, for the most part, these people are you know, upstanding human beings, and they, they definitely deserve some sort of protection. But the DREAM Act failed in Congress. Um, it did not pass, and this was, uh, again, something which I'm not happy about. In 2012, June of 2012, the president announced a new policy known as DACA, D-A-C-A, -A, which stood for Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. What was DACA? So first of all, it was not amnesty, and I will make this point very clear. This was not about granting citizenship to the dreamers. DACA, can everyone just take the thing out of their bag and get this crumpling? <laughs> this is a bad, this is a bad if, if, just take it out. Sorry, Josh. No, that's okay. I feel like I'm like I'm like 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 a, like a breeze is coming through. <laughs> Pro tip for next food. Yeah, the next next food event. Okay. Oh wow, that's so much better. Okay. So DACA, D-A-C-A, -A, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, was not amnesty. What it did do was that it gave certain minors who had education of college or high school and who were not criminals deferred prosecution. What does that mean? The president said, I will not deport you. I will not remove you. And as a consequence of giving this deferred action, these aliens also received work authorization. Now, that's actually provided by regulation. The president did not make this up. But what's novel about DACA was the size and the scope. As I'll get into in a few minutes, this was a big, big expansion for what previous presidents had done before. About 1.5 million people, estimates were fuzzy, but a million and a half people were then eligible for this deferred action status. Okay, fine. That was DACA. Fast forward to last summer. You may recall that there was a move to actually pass bipartisan immigration reform. Uh, the Senate, in a rare moment of bipartisanship, actually passed a bill. And then it went to the House. And you'll recall a guy by the name of Eric Cantor. Um, Eric Cantor was a House majority leader. And then he was suddenly picked off in a primary, largely on the basis that Cantor supported immigration reform. Almost immediately after this, John Boehner, former speaker, did a 180. He said, OK, we can't bring this up for a vote in the House. In fact, if you read Charlie Savage's new book, apparently the, the House was only a few days away from actually voting on immigration. But that never happened. 
So in the morning, John Boehner announces the Republicans will not take a vote on immigration. Okay, fine. That afternoon, President Obama gave an address to the White House. And he said very clearly, if Congress will not act, I will. And I will take every action in my power to deal with this immigration problem. So he didn't actually do anything right away. In fact, the president did nothing right away. About two weeks after the election, though, the president announced a new policy known as DAPA, D-A-P-A. -A. And what it stands for is actually, people don't agree what it stands for, but generally speaking, <laughs> Deferred Action for Parents of Americans or Deferred Action for Parental Accountability. There's all these different acronyms. Just call it DAPA. It's easy enough. So what did DAPA do? Primarily, it expanded the audience of who can get deferred action. So while DACA were the so-called dreamer, these people came here illegally as minors uh, through no fault of their own, in the case of DAPA, these were people who were the parents of US citizens. Right? As we know in the United States, by virtue of birthright citizenship, anyone born here becomes a citizen. Now what happens to that person's parents? Okay, Now their parents could then apply for this deferred action status. As a consequence of getting this deferred action status, they were then given work authorization, which by all means means you could work illegally, uh, uh, support your family, do all sorts of things. Now, a funny thing happened after DAPA was announced. A lawsuit was filed by my home state, the, 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 the state of Texas, challenging the constitutionality of DAPA. Um, this lawsuit, frankly, I think took the administration by surprise. They had already started leasing real estate and spending money and training employees to start this program. They weren't expecting this. And then another crazy thing happened. A federal district court in Brownsville, Texas, Judge Hainan, actually issued an injunction telling the Obama administration to put DAPA on hold. And then something else happened. It was appealed to the Fifth Circuit. And the Obama administration sort of stayed from the Fifth Circuit. And uh, uh, the Fifth Circuit panel said, no, we will not grant a stay. Now, this decision was not based on constitutional law. It was based on administrative law, which I am not talking about today. I do not want to put notes and comment. That's boring. Let's talk about the con law for a second. One other note that's also relevant. The Obama administration did not seek a stay from the US Supreme Court. They did not. Um, and their failure to seek a stay from the Supreme Court means this case is being stretched out quite far. And there's a very strong chance that there, the Fifth Circuit may not rule until maybe January or February of this year, in which case a cert petition won't go up to maybe March or April for conference. This case, I'm, at this point, I'm pretty sure it will not be argued this term unless something very fancy happens and they move quickly. In other words, this case we decided after the next presidential election, which I think is probably the, the safest bet for the court for reasons maybe I'll talk about after if you want to talk to me. But the posture of the case now is it's pending for the Fifth Circuit. Now, the gravamen of the uh, district court and the Fifth Circuit decision is about administrative law, notice and comment. I want to talk, as the, as the it, at announcement says aptly, about the take care clause. Okay? So the take care clause says that the president shall take care that the laws are faithfully executed. And frankly, this is a clause that hasn't really been litigated very much. Usually, presidents try to do too much stuff. But in the age of Obama, he's trying to do too little stuff. He's not enforcing the law, or so the charge goes. So how did the president justify the legality of granting deferred action status up to 4 million aliens whose children were US citizens? So the Office of Legal Counsel released a memorandum. And this was a very significant step to actually justify the legality. I'm going to read from the memorandum in a second. What the, what the memorandum said is that an agency, the executive can't just rewrite the laws. right? They can't just pretend to be using prosecutorial discretion and the process rewrite the laws. Instead, they must, and I'm going to read your quote, the agency's enforcement decision must be consonant with, rather than uh, contrary to, congressional policy. In other words, what the president's doing must be consonant with, rather than contrary to. Um, this is a citation of Justice Jackson's, of course, famous concurrence, that when the president's actions are compatible with Congress, he's acting at the lowest ebb. OK, fine. Using this framework, which I, I agree with, I think this is probably the right framework, the OLC memo approves of DAPA. Now, I think where this memo falters is based on actual study of immigration law. The separation of powers analysis is strong. Uh, and I have two articles, one in the Georgetown Law Journal Online, and the other in the Texas Review of Law and Politics, making this argument in much more detail. So I'll sketch it out here. Simply stated first, the category of aliens benefited by DAPA, that is, the parents of US citizens. This is a category that Congress has strongly disfavored and has put many barriers in the way of them remaining in this country. 
Second, the manner in which the president is engaged in this deferred action is not consistent with what previous presidents have done. Previous presidents have used deferred action as a bridge from one status to the next, not as kind of a tunnel to go over and around and through the laws of Congress. So let me start with the first point. Um, generally speaking, under immigration law, if a person is not here legally and gives birth to a child, that child by virtue of the 14th Amendment is a U.S. citizen. But contrary to the, uh, you know, whatever you hear on cable news, the parent doesn't get citizenship automatically. In fact, Congress said the parent must wait 21 years from birth before the child can petition for what's called an adjustment of status, right? 21 years. So it's not the case that people are coming here giving birth and just, you know, getting citizenship immediately. That doesn't happen. But this is actually quite deliberate. When the Immigration and Nationality Act was passed in 1965, Congress made a very decided choice. In light of birthright citizenship, they wanted to make it tough for the parents of U.S. citizens to get a visa or get some sort of a pathway to citizenship. In fact, there's this great colloquy between Senator Robert Kennedy and Senator Sam, Sam Irvin. These are not, not right-wing nutjobs, right? Explaining we don't want people coming here and having their kids be born and becoming uh, citizens right away. So that's fine. But what DAPA does is it basically approximates the exact evil that Congress is trying to solve. DAPA basically says, we will give you this deferred action for three years, and it's renewable. And, and, and in the process, we will not deport you merely because of a US a citizen child. Um, this is largely consistent with how Congress designed the immigration scheme. The very class of aliens that Congress is trying to make hard to get here, DAPA is putting them front and center. Um, the second argument focuses, again, on past practice. So often in executive power, as Justice Jackson wrote this beautifully, um, we don't have hard and fast rules. So practice plays a very important role. And in terms of using deferred action, there's been a, 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 a usual trend of how executives have done it. I'll give you a very good example. So say you were a foreign student at Tulane University in New Orleans in 2005. You're registered for classes. You have a student visa. Everything's great. And then Hurricane Katrina hits, and your university is shut down. Because you're no longer enrolled with a number of credits, you lose your student visa. It's gone, right? Your student visa is dependent on you maintaining a credit load. So one thing that President W. Bush did is he said, OK, I will use deferred action, right? I will say, you had the status. You lost because of the hurricane. I won't deport you for these three or four months. Go enroll at another university for the spring semester in January. You'll be fine, OK? This was a limited, narrow, targeted use of deferred action that bridged one lawful status to another <coughs> lawful status. And indeed, if you study all of the instances in the OLC memo that are cited, there's always a sort of a bridge, that there's something lawful, and on the other end of the horizon, you're, you're going to get something, right? With ADAPA beneficiaries, there's no pot of gold on the other end of the rainbow. After the three-year uh, deferred action period, the parent of the U.S. citizen is in the exact same spot, unless their child perhaps is aged up to 21. So there's nothing at their end. In other words, presidents have done this in consonant with congressional policy. There was something waiting at their end. And there are other examples involving widows and the Violence Against Women Act and different instances where presidents have used deferred action as a bridge. And this actually must be contradistinguished with using it in the context of foreign relations. So for example, uh, some of the refugees from Tiananmen Square, for example, were granted deferred action. This is, again, under the president's par uh, powers of foreign policy. DAPA is irrespective of national origin. It's nothing to do with refugee status. It's open to Mexicans, Canadians alike. There's no actual uh, foreign policy here. So for these two primary reasons, and reasons I can maybe go into in the Q&A, the president's actions are not consonant with congressional policy. And more troubling, Congress has uh, actually opposed them. Um, Congress passed resolutions condemning this action. And indeed, Congress tried to defund it. But one of the aspects of DAPA is it can't be defunded. Yes, DAPA is paid for by fees, agency fees, right? People who pay fees to apply for this. So even if Congress had shut down the DHS, there's no way they could have stopped this. They could have impeached everyone, and this policy would have remained. Uh, and for this reason, I'm actually uh, uh, somewhat, uh, not to the merits, but I think this is an area where judicial scrutiny is actually warranted in light of the posture of this case and because of this stark separation of powers. And I'll close with one thought and give Professor Chilton a, a comment. Um, it's very easy to think of this as a beneficent uh, aspect of prosperal discretion. But the same precedent in the hands of a different president uh, could be quite dangerous. So imagine if President Ted Cruz decides to grant deferred action for environmental offenders and says, you know what, we don't have enough resources for this. Or if President Rand Paul decides to uh, uh, not enforce aspects of the corporate income tax. Um, 
the specter of non-enforcement is very dangerous. And I encourage you to think very deeply about the precedents being set now and how they can be used by a president you do not agree with. And by the same token that President Obama is granting lots of discretion for immigration, President Cruz may not. And he may start deporting a lot more people under the exact same scope of discretion. Uh, 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 so this is a very dangerous area. It's very precarious. And uh, 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 maybe the courts will resolve it. Maybe they won't. But at least we'll talk about it today. Thank you very much for your time. And I welcome Adam to an uh, awesome comments. Thank you so much. So I want to thanks, everyone, for having me and for, for, uh, for Josh for flying out here and doing this debate with us. Uh, I want to start with the nightmare scenario that Josh ended with. So the nightmare scenario is future president Ted Cruz comes into office and he stops enforcing the law that we all think is important. For example, he stops for, uh, prosecuting uh, corporations for, uh, that are harming the environment. Now, this seems bad, right? Uh, we might not want this. We might think that these are laws that we care about and we want to see enforced. Now, this isn't a far-fetched scenario. Instead, this is the way that literally every administration has ever worked. Here's an example. Congress in the 1990s, as part of the immigration reform, passed a lot of uh, new laws and stricter regulations about employer sanctions. That is, if you employ an illegal immigrant, that is, that you can be subject to fines, even imprisonment, right? And Congress made it abundantly clear that they thought that we should focus on the demand side more than the supply side. George Bush comes into office, 9-11 happens, there's new priorities, and they uh, stop enforcing these laws against corporations. It goes down to basically zero. Now, you can't find Cato or Heritage or the other groups that have been so mad about DAPA and DACA being upset at George W. Bush during this period. In this case, it's OK that the president isn't fully enforcing the laws, because there's a lot of going on, and we have different priorities. Now, in this case, when it's the families of, uh, of people that have been here, 11 million people, and it's impractical to, uh, to deport all of them, in this case, the president's clearly saying what his plan is and being transparent about it so we can have a public debate on it. This is what's upset people. Now, think about it for a second. First off, it's common course for administrations to under-enforce laws. That's why you are all able to drink in college. Uh, it's also the case that it, priorities change and ebb and flow based on realities. Now, there's nothing new as a result. It's not a nightmare scenario. It's what elections are about and the way that politics work. All right, so I want to do three things, though. I want to talk about some common ground that I think we can find, and then I want to respond to Josh's argument about whether or not uh, these groups are particularly disfavored groups, and then also about whether or not this extends beyond precedent. All right, first, what's some common ground? I think there's a few things that we can all agree on uh, and that every road resource person should think. First off, there's a huge number of laws that are under-enforced and that Congress will pass a statute banning it and the administration decides not to expend resources on doing it. That's common courts. Second thing we can all agree on, the administration is resource constrained on the number of people that can be deported. Now, there's roughly 11 million undocumented people in the United States, according to most estimates, and the Obama administration uh, deports about 400,000 a year. Now, there isn't really any argument that the administration could be doing more given the amount of money and resources that they have. That's just a reality. There isn't the amount of money, time, or resources to deport 11 million people. I think we can agree on that. Third thing we can all agree on. Obama has been called the deporter-in-chief. That is, he's deported more people than any other president in US history. This isn't someone that's ignored his obligation to deport some people that are criminals or have other problems, but instead been going too aggressive. He's been attacked on the left from immigrants groups, for Hispanics rights groups, from being too aggressive in these policies. I don't think we can disagree there. Next thing I don't think we can disagree on. Even if a president has resources, they're not obligated to exercise them because we have prosecutorial discretion. That is, even if a US attorney's office has all of the money in the world, a case can come in where someone's used drugs or committed a crime, and they can say, for interests of fairness, equity, um, other legal considerations, we're going to pass on this. Now, that's exactly what you should be learning in law school and ethics classes, et cetera, when to exercise that kind of discretion in a humane way. And it's consistent with our legal system going back to the founding. Prosecutorial discretion means you don't have to exercise the law to the extent of it. Now, the final thing that I can think that we can all agree on is that the pre this doesn't mean that the president can do literally anything in the realm of immigration rights. Obama couldn't start issuing green cards to people that clearly don't qualify them. Now, prior presidents have done something that looks like this in a few cases, but I think that would be on the scope. 
Instead, the concept of deferred action is a legally existing category, and the question is whether or not he's using it too much. Right? This is a legal category. So the debate that we're having here, we agree that there's resource constraints. We agree that there's prosecutorial discretion. We agree that this isn't just making people citizens overnight. The question is whether or not this category can be used more. I think given all of these arguments that we should all agree on, it's perhaps not only reasonable, but it's perhaps the only reasonable and humane way to behave given these realities. All right, so Josh has two arguments against this. So his first argument is that this isn't, the way that Obama did this is not consistent with congressional intent because Congress specifically considered the parents of citizens or legal permanent residents at different points and decided not to give them citizenship. I have two problems with this argument. The first is the way it treats congressional intent and the second is on the specifics. So first, the problem about this way of thinking about congressional intent. So first, it's a well-known problem that when you have groups of individuals that it's near incoherent to talk about their collective intent. Now this goes back to Arrow, who's proven this formally, or more recently, Ken Shepsley, who's famously written about how Congress is a they, not an it. And we can't say what they had in mind because you have 435 different people in the House, 100 in the Senate, that all think different things and will say different things at the time. Now, beyond that, it's the case that congressional intent is something that's easily gameable. You can put something into the congressional record saying that the point of this law is X, even if you're the only person that thinks that. As a result, judges like Easterbrook and, uh, and academics like Epstein have said over and over again, I don't care what Congress said the point of this law was, show me the text. Now, most of us think there's sets of circumstances where we still have to look at congressional intent. But it's a really narrow set of circumstances that even uh, the most uh, intensivist among us would say that we should look at. What is that? When you have a specific piece of statutory text where there's something ambiguous, you can't figure out by just looking at the text. So you need to start looking at other sources of information to tell, tell you what Congress meant about that specific piece of the statute. So you look at the other parts of the law. You look at the legislative posture, the history, what they were writing against. Right? In those cases, it might be a reasonable way to help resolve these ambiguities. Now, this case is nothing like that. It's so far extremely different than that. Why is that? First off, the immigration statute's a 50-year-old statute that's been amended countless times by dozens of different Congresses. The result is, speaking about what the intent of Congress is around the INA, that's a 300-page long document, is near incomprehensible. The second thing, however, is that there's no set section of the statute that says, this is our priorities. Instead, it's the case that when Josh says, this is a group that's specifically disfavored, He's not looking at one piece of the statute. What you have to do is say, looking at all of the statute, I think that this group is particularly disfavored or unlikely uh, to get this reward. The result is, though, that you have to sift through all of these different sections to try to make that argument. This is exactly the wrong kind of situation where we should be looking at congressional intent. Now, I want to say one other thing here, uh, something that's pretty ironic in the way that congressional debate, uh, uh, constitutional debates gone in the last year. We all remember the lawsuits about Obama, uh, the Ob Obamacare. Right? And in that case, there's one or two really poorly crafted sentences in the, the framework of a huge law. And conservative groups were saying, you can't look at congressional intent. You have to look at those two sentences. All right. Now, one year later, we have a bill that's 300 pages long, totally confused. And the argument is, we have to think about what Congress wanted. Right? It's just super ironic and the, uh, the wrong place to be making these kinds of arguments. All right. So that's why I think it's the wrong way to think about congressional intent. But secondly, I think there's a problem with Josh's specific claim. So Josh's specific claim is uh, that Congress thought about giving status to, um, to these parents, but specifically decided against it and said, said uh, no, nope, you can't have it until after 21 years. As a result, it's a specifically disfavored group. Here's the problem with that argument. It proves far too much because Congress has specifically debated giving every possible class of citizens the right to green cards and the right to legal permanent status. For example, there's this um, relief from removal part of the statute that says, if you've been in the United States undocumented for 10 years, had good moral character, and met some other criteria, you get to say. As part of that debate, they debated considering literally everyone, right? As a result, Congress has specifically disfavored everyone by not letting them in. Now, remember back when I told you there's 11 million people and only 4 million can be deported. I could put literally any group and say that we're not gonna deport them, and you could then point out, ah, Congress specifically disfavored that group, <laughs> because they didn't let them be part of the relief for removal, right? But beyond that, Congress, since 1996, has passed additional laws saying that our biggest priority is criminal enforcement. Now, maybe if Obama said, I'm going to stop deporting criminals, we'd have a problem. But instead, what he said is, we're going to keep deporting 400,000 criminals a year and focus our priorities on that. 
If you think of the question as that, that Obama said, I'm specifically going to focus on criminals, in that case, I think that's the thing that's most consistent with what we can think of as congressional intent. All right, so that's the first argument. The second argument is about precedent. Once again, I have a problem with this way of thinking about precedent and then a, an argument about the specifics. So why is this a problematic way to think about precedent? All right, so as lawyers, we normally talk about precedent in the judicial context. And there, we typically think that precedent is important when it's vertical precedent. That is, if the Supreme Court makes a decision, the Seventh Circuit should follow it. Or if the Seventh Circuit makes a decision, the uh, District Court of Illinois should follow it, right? It's vertical, it goes from top to bottom. Horizontal precedent we take dramatically less seriously. Now, horizontal precedent is the idea that the Supreme Court has to follow a previous decision, or if one circuit's made a decision, the other circuits have to follow it. Instead, they reconsider the case, and in many cases, they'll reverse their prior judgment, right? We think that's acceptable because it's how the law can adapt to changing circumstances. In this case, Josh is making arguments based on prior past presidential decisions. That's horizontal precedent. There's no reason that it's binding on a future president if the circumstances have changed. As a result, I think it's the wrong way to think about the concept of historical precedent. Now, there is still one kind of case where we make arguments in constitutional law about historical precedent, but they're when, it's when it's claims about inherent congressional powers. Mm -hmm. So if the Obama administration's argument was about an inherent Article II power to make this argument, and it was an argument that's just purely separation of powers, then you look to historical practice between the two branches. But when it's a statutory interpretation question, I think it's a mistake to say all prior administrations have stopped here and you should too. It's problematic because it suggests that the cap on what's acceptable is whatever the first action was, right? The first time that Obama or whoever, whatever president decided to issue deferred action, that would set the limit because any future time someone like Josh could come along and say, well, last time it didn't go as far, right? That's why we don't think that's an acceptable way to think about historical precedent when it's under statutory interpretation. All right. The second thing is Josh's argument, the specific though, uh, the specific claim is that look, in the past there was always a pathway to citizenship or something in the future, not necessarily citizenship, but it's this um, sort of bridging period. So you give them deferred action now because they can get something later. And this is what happened for the Tulane students, it's what happened for widows, et cetera. That's not what, it happened in many of those cases, but not all cases. So it's also the case that deferred action's been granted to the families of militaries. No necessary pass to citizenship or bridging there. It's also been the case that in 1996, uh, Congress passed this massive reform of the immigration law. At the time, they considered which groups to let in, which groups to let out. Ronald Reagan decided that it would be unacceptable to deport some of the family members and decided against, uh, against doing so, publicly said that he was going to include them. Four or five years later, Congress came along and then gave them uh, a path to status as well. Now, you could say it was bridging that four or five years, but there wasn't a clear path at the time that Reagan made the decision. Instead, he said, based on the existing law, I think this is reasonable, and Congress later responded. The parallel case here is Obama's made a decision based on the law, and Congress may or may not give these people status in five or six years, depending on the composition of Congress. The fact that there's bridging isn't an inherent reason. It doesn't say in the law, you can only issue deferred action if there's the possibility of bridging. Instead, it's just trying to come up with a way to explain the prior precedents in a way that excludes this precedent. But not only does not all precedent cut that way, but there's no reason to think it's a limit based on the text of the law. As a result, given what I said at the start, the realities that we're facing, the, um, the huge human crisis that we have here, and the economic toll that we cost from, come from deporting 11 million people, I think this is reasonable, and I think it's a, a completely consistent way to think about executive power. Thanks. I now know why you're an international debate champion, uh, which, I, which, I, which I appreciate. So a couple points to respond. So first, um, I actually need to commend Cato for a bit. Um, Cato takes a policy of immigration that they favor the president's policies very strongly, but they took a policy that is unconstitutional. Um, they've taken some heat in this. The immigration community is not happy that Cato, which usually favors open borders, put it simply, is actually in favor of something which would uh, stop that. So. Uh, you know, also, I was in law school during those things happening in the Bush administration, so I will take no credit, but I will, I will yell at any president that decides to violate the Constitution. So I will I'll make that claim here. Republican or Democrat, <laughs> doesn't, does not matter. So the first point is Professor uh, Chilton says, you know, show me the text, show me the text. Okay, I'll show you the text. It's in the text. The group, the parents of citizens must wait 21 years. That's codified in the text. It's not a they or an issue. It's right there in the text. The parents of lawful permanent residents can never, ever, ever, ever petition for a change of status. 
right? I didn't mention this, but parents of lawful present re uh, LPRs, they can get deferred action. They can never get it. So we don't need to get to the epistemological debates about intent, which I, which I would love discussing. It's right there in the text. Um, this, the second major point he raises has with horizontal privity and what's the role of precedent. And, and to the extent that we like what the Supreme Court says in executive power, they, they've addressed this. For example, Noel Canning, a decision involving acquiescence, right? If there's been a long time practice to which Congress has acquiesced, even if it's a weak claim of inherent to otherwise authority, the courts will generally defer. This is why I think the bridge analogy is very helpful as a limiting principle. Because if this is something the president has done and Congress has not complained about it, well, then that's an indication that, you know what, maybe the courts should stay out of it. But this case is actually quite different. What we have here is the president taking an action that is not consistent with what Congress has enacted. It's not consistent with what previous presidents have done. And Congress has opposed it strenuously. There is no acquiescence in this case. And because there's no acquiescence, I think that the lack of authority here is actually, uh, is, is actually salient. Now, I, I think a, a broader point about this is that the limits Professor Chilton is arguing are far broader than those advanced by the Office of Legal Counsel. Right? The Office of Legal Counsel exists as a check on the executive branch. It's, it's supposed to. Go read Charlie Savage's new book about how the OLC has kind of withered. Eric Posner has written about this at great length, perhaps to his joy and amusement. Um, <laughs> but basically, OLC exists as a check. And OLC has basically acknowledged the same framework I'm advancing, that when the president doesn't enforce it, there's a threat of not, I'm sorry, when the president doesn't enforce the law, there's a threat that he's doing it to just ignore it. Not good old-fashioned prosperous discretion, but he's actually trying to get around it. And that's why I think the history of DAPA and DACA are salient. The president asked Congress, can we do X? Congress said no. The president said, okay, I'll do as much of X as I humanly can. Right? And he went to his lawyers. And again, Charlie Savage writes about this. Maybe it's right or wrong, but he writes about this. He said, I want to do as much as I can. And they gave him one policy. No, this doesn't go far enough. Go further. Go further. Go further. And the president said, keep going further, keep going further, until he finally reached a point where he was uh, uh, content with it. And this was far beyond anything that's been done before. Uh, he mentioned various deferred action of President Reagan. Um, these are things that were ancillary to statutes. They were connected to some sort of congressional change that, that actually had already happened. Um, uh, in the terms of the uh, uh, foreign policy, the president's used deferred action in other areas. But what this boils down to, and, and again, maybe this is a little cynical or not, but the president was unhappy with what Congress gave him, so he tried to create the status that would get people around until they actually pass the bill. And the president basically said it will be impossible for a future president to remove those granted this status. Um, in terms of the take care clause, I've actually done some historical research on this, but the Constitution says the president shall take care of the laws that are faithfully executed. If you actually study how the framers conceived this, it was a good faith standard in contracts, right? And a good faith standard in contracts doesn't mean you do everything. You always have to, but you're basically trying to comply in terms of agency law, trying to comply, comply with, the, with the power given to you. Um, the president himself said many times he could not do this. He repeated it countless times that he could not do this, and then suddenly when Congress told him no, he suddenly discovered the power to do it. Um, I recognize that this is indeed a bold claim, and, and it would perhaps uh, avert the sort of nightmare situations. But going forward, the threat of under-enforcement in the era of gridlock is perhaps one of the biggest threats we face. Uh, if Congress can't pass laws anymore, which very likely may happen for the foreseeable future, I think presidents of both parties will basically be relegated to the idea of saying, okay, you know what, just not going to enforce this. Not going to force this, going to under-enforce this, going to under-enforce this. Uh, I think you had David Bernstein here yesterday, who was my column professor, uh, and he wrote a new book discussing various acts of under-enforcement, but this is not limited to immigration. In terms of Obamacare, various acts of the law have been enforced, the mandates have been enforced, various waivers have been granted, and this has become a new modus operandi. And I would be very cautious to sanction this because of the size and the scale. Now, in terms of the judicial response, because we have an injunction, right, because we have an injunction, we have a unique opportunity. Had DAPA gone into effect and people were granted this status, a judicial declaration of unconstitutionality will withdrawn that status. We don't have that. This has not gone into effect. And, and indeed, we do not have any sort of irreparable harm. The government didn't even seek a state from the Supreme Court, right? So the issue of immigration will fall to the next president. So this actually gives a court perhaps a pristine opportunity to address this without the idea of King v. Burwell, millions will lose their insurance, right? This one will basically maintain the status quo as it's been. The president can still deport criminals over families. And, and if nothing else, perhaps set a precedent for why this under enforcement law is not a good idea. All right, what time do we have till 1.30? No, 120. 1.20. Professor Chilton, you want to respond and we can do a Q&A perhaps? Uh, yeah, sounds good. Thank you, sir. And I'll, I'll let you have the last word, then I'll go to Q&A. All right. Uh, 
All right, so I'll just respond to, to uh, three of the points that, that Josh raised here. Um, so the first point uh, that, that Josh said is that we can look to the text, and the text specifically says uh, that um, the parents of legal permanent residents can't get, can't get status until uh, the child's at least 21 years old. Never. No, LPR is oh, never. Oh, sorry. Yeah, LPR is never. Citizens after 21. Right. Um, OK. Uh, it says they can't get status. If you look at the text, it doesn't say they can't get deferred action, right? So if we want to be textualist about this, that's not even in that section. So uh, I, I, <laughs> I think that it's taking, it's just, there's a section on deferred action, there's a section on when you can get. Uh, deferred action is not the INA, by the way. Well, it's, yeah, it's, it's came out came out in 81, and then Congress acted after it was already existing, and they acted against that backdrop. But um uh, uh, I think that we, we all agree that the deferred, uh, deferred action can and does exist. All right, so I think that the, the text doesn't, doesn't stop the president from doing this. We'd have a problem if he was handing out green cards, but the deferred action is totally different because it's revocable at any time and it doesn't get you all of the privileges. So the text would prohibit the green cards or the citizenship, doesn't prohibit the deferred action. And so I think and this is a case where if you want to be a textualist about it, you come to a different conclusion. The second point that, that Josh raised is that um, uh, to make the, the Noel, Calling, uh, Noel Canning argument. Say, look, this isn't something where there's been long acquiescence to this. This is instead something radically different. I think that that's um, uh, ignoring the reality that we all know that existed until last November, which is that there were 11 million people in this country. This was not a secret. It was a well-known fact. Congress was aware of it. Uh, and they were okay with the fact that the president only had enough resources to deport 400 people. And instead, they were passing laws saying that you should focus on criminals that have create, uh, committed aggregated felonies. That's the reality that existed. And as a result, that is Congress acquiescing. Now, it's true. Congress hadn't acquiesced to Obama making a public statement about this policy and telling people what he was going to do. But I don't know why the Congress has the ability to be upset about the policy pronouncements of the president in this way. And I think that that's problematic. But additionally, I think the Supreme Court's recognized that essentially the system's acquiesced. Now, this was in the case, uh, the um, United States v. Arizona case that went up to the Supreme Court. So in that case, Arizona passed a law saying, we're going to go ahead and enforce the federal immigration law. So we're going to use the same law, but we're going to use our law enforcement resources to enforce it. Now, the federal government brought suit against Arizona and said, wait a second. If we don't feel like doing this, you shouldn't be doing it on our behalf. And the Supreme Court said, Look, the executive has this discretion and is able to make pro policy priorities and to decide how to carry them out. And it's a federalism problem if the state is enforcing this national law. So even though Arizona is deciding to enforce existing federal law, the Supreme Court is more deferential to the reality that that's not exactly the way we've decided to behave as a country. This is another example of the legal recognition of this acquiescence to the reality that we have 11 million undocumented people and we don't have the political will, resources, or I think the, you know, the callousness of heart to tear these people away from their families. So that's the second point, acquiescence. The third point is about the OL, uh, OLC framework. And what Josh says is, look, the OLC framework clearly says that you have to think about what's consistent uh, and consonant <coughs> with prior congressional pronouncements on this. And his argument is that this move isn't because it, it goes against what Congress said. Now, the thing I would say here is it's all about the general of, uh, level of generality you look at. If you look at the INA, you could say that family reunification is the primary goal of the INA. It's how we base most of our immigration categories, and that would be completely reasonable. Now, it might be the case that specific groups within families were said, yes, no, yes, no, the X many years, X status, X relationship, et cetera. But once again, I told you that proves too much because it was the case that every group that doesn't have status Congress considered and decided not to give it to them. Now, if Obama had said, actually, what we've decided to do is to deport the families of military members and we're going to let the criminals stay, that to me seems like it would be inconsistent with what Congress wanted. But when instead what he said is we're going to deport criminals and let families stay and not deport them, that seems fairly consistent with all of the congressional pouncements until last November. So in essence, what we have here is not that people were upset with the underlying policy so much. It's the fact that it made it more official, right? Obama made this announcement and then offered to give out these pieces of paper saying that you had deferred action. What all this is doing is making, uh, making people's de jure status consistent with their de facto status in a way that we've had for decades. I don't think it's a problem once there's the provision within the law that allows him to offer a deferred status in this way. And there's nothing special about the number. 
The law didn't say it can only be 60,000. The fact that it's several million, it's true that it's a dramatic difference, but so is the number of undocumented people within this country. And I think it's just reflecting that reality. All right, let's do Q&A, Josh. Yeah. Uh, yes, ma'am, right there. Uh, this is from Professor Schultz. Uh, so I agree, you're an excellent debater. He's really, he's, this while. is hard. This is real good. I was super convinced until I remember Youngstown. It seems like you were totally disregarding it, right? So I just have some questions about that. You disregarded the historical practice approach, but yeah. I think it's a relation power now to like every other day. We don't even talk about executive power, and I know the formulation may be in a separate context, but they're right. talking about historical laws, and that was Frank Berger's big concurrence that the court cites to over and over again in this context. And then in regards to the legislative intent and it being the lowest ebb, so I agree that Josh's point about the congressional record is not the strongest, but I think he was just using that as like an illustrative um, you know, further point. I think the whole point was that the fact that they put that the uh, that Obama tried to get this passed the legislation, Congress clearly said no, and then two weeks later he comes out with this policy. I think it directly parallels kind of what happened. It's almost an even more um, insolent example than like what we have against now with the Taft Harley Act, where Congress was like, no, and the president's like, well, I'm just going to do it anyways. So I think that I agree with you on like legislative intent not being a thing, but I think when they <laughs> shoot up, shut down a statue like they did with the Taft Harley Act, I think it's more directly here that is so clearly the lowest step. So if you want to disagree with use of Jackson's concurrence anymore, then I'm with you on the constitutional stuff. But given that we've been using this town for decades and decades in situations like this, I'm wondering how you get around that. Right. Uh, so uh, I think this is, is consistent with what I said, which is that uh, in general with the president, that we, we don't 